Hello everybody, my name is Micah Thorson, and my project was focused around scrap reduction. This project was done at Boston Scientific. For people that aren't familiar with it, their core business is heart, digestive, pulmonary, vascular, and neurology. This was mostly, actually 100% focused in neurology. Um, the company has about 24,000 employees worldwide, and I think 14,000 of those are within the Twin Cities alone. So they've got a lot of people here. My role at the company is I'm an R&D technician right now, um, and what that includes is a lot of process validation, test method validation, um, spec setting for processes, and things like that. Um, the problem statement is we're generating a lot of scrap. It comes out to about 1.6 million on these two product lines alone. Actually, let me set it back. They're not so much product lines as much as they are components that go into the same finished product. Both. Uh, the paralene coating and then the KRT tubing that we'll be talking about both go into a finished device. <clears throat> so, with that, I will step into my first deliverable. So this deliverable was all about trying to find the optimal material for the core stock. Um, and that's, of course, the piece of, uh, the piece of manufacturing aid that the silicone is extruded over. That, through root cause on an A3, was found to be generating a bunch of particles because it's made out of PTFE, and that's a paste extruded process. So, um, after we kind of after they kind of determined the root cause of that, we were able to go through and try to figure out the requirements, what was necessary to actually make a better product, or what we thought would make a better product. So ultimately, we went through and I met with the MEs, and I met with a bunch of supplier quality, and then our suppliers to buy the stuff, and. We found, a, we found a vendor, we picked out our material, and then I generated um, this material spec here. And the material that we ended up selecting was a, it was a PFA, which is actually a relative to PTFE, it's another floral polymer. And the big benefit this has is it's a melt extruded process, so it doesn't generate the particles within the silicone when they're removing the core stock after manufacturing it. Some of the issues we had about when we were going about doing this was getting the, the supplier to agree to the tolerances that we needed. We needed plus or minus two thou. On their website, they said they could do plus or minus three. Our buyer had a pretty good relationship with them. They were able to negotiate this to actually uh, align with our specs that we sent them. Some of the other issues that we had was, so at Boston Scientific, they do a thing called the PCAP, which is process analysis, to make sure that this change won't affect anything else within the process. We didn't know whether we were going to have to go through and revalidate or if this could just be a clean swap with the new, the new core stock. So, the outcomes of this were we dropped scrap rates down to 2%. They were roughly at about 10 to 40, depending on the day or the month or the week, or even a lot. It varied quite a bit. Um, and some of the things that I definitely learned from this were soft skills. There's a big group of people that you have to communicate to to get anything done within a big company like that. And the importance of understanding your manufacturer, your supplier's manufacturing processes and how they can drastically impact your process. So my second deliverable was actually my favorite because I love playing in Excel. It's probably my favorite thing to do. <laughs> um, so it was a cost-benefit analysis on that core stock. So after we had selected the material, we got some of this in for a prototype run. And using the numbers from that prototype run, I was able to go through and calculate a deterministic model for how much money could potentially be saved each year. Um, after, we, after that was generated, we, went, we met with the management in charge of scrap reduction. And we had to go through and figure out if there's enough money there to justify the project cost. So here's a snapshot of the deterministic cost-benefit analysis that I put together. Some of the issues that we had was it took a little while to get quotes on some of this stuff, and we had some little tweaks as we went along. Um, there is a question about long-term scrap rates, because this was a short prototype run. You don't necessarily know what your distribution of scrap is going to look like. And another one was the discussion on whether this is enough money to save, but based on what I've been hearing from them now, that, that number's actually gone up from what you see here. And this is actually, actually this led then to another one. I wasn't completely satisfied with the deterministic model. 
So I created a Monte Carlo model that went through and added in variance of the three different things generating scrap. It dropped the savings down to about 205 from 233. Um, actually, that was a lot of fun. So the things I learned with this is how important it is to understand the distribution of your data and how much that can affect the outcome of the material savings. I also learned that, or actually I should say scrap savings, I also learned that it's amazing how much money you can save just by reducing scrap even if your material costs go up. So my next one was a root cause analysis. This was done on the perylene part. This is the second component that I was talking about that goes in complete this finished device. This is a coating that goes inside the cylinders that helps present, prevent premature wear. It's a big deal because this is getting implanted in the body. You don't want to prematurely explant it from somebody. That's a big issue. So the way I went about putting this together was I had to go meet with um, the project team. So this was a, a specialized team that's put together just to reduce scrap. A bunch of the fellows were from Ireland that presented its own problems. Um, going through, after we got the data, I went through and analyzed it to figure out what, what our biggest cause of, of defects was. And then I went back and reviewed the results of that same team and see if they agreed with what we had found. After that, we were able to start brainstorming potential root causes to some of the leading scrap codes. Here's a snapshot. So we did it through a Pareto chart. And as you can see, the biggest one is particles. And that's led by the PC too long. So PC is parallel coding. Um, so what we found was that this, the PC too long was generated by the operators cutting off this thing called shrink tubing that keeps parts from getting treated where we don't want it to be treated. And then, oh yeah, yeah, and then the Particle one. Yeah, where it was. Oh. <laughs> oh yeah, the particle. What we thought caused the particles was uh, the shrink tube and getting cut in process, and that getting stuck to the silicone and then getting embedded in. I'll talk about that a lot more as we get further on. That actually touches on the next two deliverables. So here you can see this is scrap code 74. That's the embedded particles, and the other one is scrap code 82, and that's the parallel coding too long. Some of the issues we had with this was uh, we actually found out there, there's a misalignment of specs. So the upstream process had a spec that was bigger than the downstream process. So parts could get through up there, they could come down to this process and then get rejected. That actually artificially inflates this number quite a bit. We don't necessarily know exactly how much yet because it hasn't been completely figured out. Um, another issue was, so from my literature review, I found it was a good idea to look for some of the scrap parts to see if they have multiple defects to see if other defects aren't getting captured for what it got scrapped for. That sounds awesome, but when you're not trained to find the defects, it's a lot harder than it sounds because these little particles, that's taken underneath the 10x microscope. So that's a pretty small particle. And then, of course, there's always another issue you had is, do you, did you actually find the cost. Now the cycles for these things can take eight hours to, to go through one cycle, so it, it takes a long time to, to know. The things I learned was how hard it is to find defects when you're not trained, how important it is to understand where your data comes from, and that's going back to the misalignment of specs. If you didn't know that was there and you didn't understand your data, you never would have known it, you would have tried forever to just solve the problem and never would have had any success. And ultimately, um, you don't know you found the root cause until the data agrees with it. So. The next one was creating a standard work. At Boston Scientific, the standard work is a little bit more like a work instruction. We don't have a lot of high-level stuff. It's very, very detailed. It tells them exactly how to do everything. So what I did with this was I went out onto the floor and I met with the production workers and I just kind of tried to get them to tell me everything that they liked, disliked, what they found that worked better, what they know that's wrong with the process that could be fixed. After I gathered all that, I brought it back to that team that's, that's focused on scrap reduction. And we kind of discussed what we were going to tackle, what's within the scope of this, what's outside the scope of this project. And then I went through and actually updated the work instructions. Now what 
mostly got updated was related to this uh, this shrink tubing that prevents the perylene from getting coated where we don't want it to be. Um, some of the issues I had with this were how do you deal with the operators um, giving input and not necessarily seeing a result at the end of the day because it fell outside of scope or because there's a solution in the future coming that's going to address it in a different manner. Um, getting the operators to feel comfortable with me, it takes a little while. The guy at the lead is really outgoing and he had no problem with it, but some of the people that work with him weren't as comfortable with me. So the outcome of this was, let me go ahead and see the snippet of it. The outcome of this was that we have a work instruction ready to go when it's time to be implemented, and when this has been all tested out and ready to be implemented as well, it has to go together as a package. It's not just one thing and then the next. Um, InMed device, it's a slow and painful process to make these changes at times, because depending on how much it impacts the process, it can be a lot of testing to prove it. And then, oh, sorry, let me go back. And the things that I learned from this were a running theme throughout this, and that's how important soft skills are. And that's one thing that we've gotten a lot of here. We've gotten a fair amount of presentation time and time to talk to people and time to kind of learn how to interact with people to get the information you need and get people to feel comfortable with you. So my final one is 5S of this perylene coating area. So this is it's, it's a unique, somewhat unique application of 5S because it's not to improve processing time or shorten cycle time, it's to remove scrap. Um, so I'll step through and what we did on each of the S's. So <clears throat> the first S back sometime a little bit after New Year's, we went through and did a deep clean of the area, kind of got rid of stuff that didn't need to be there, cleaned up corners that were pretty dirty that hadn't been getting cleaned out. Um, after that, the sort was done by a group called Atlas. So they're in charge of remediation and what, they're, what they were doing was going through and qualifying all the equipment. Part of qualifying all the equipment was making sure that equipment that's not in the process isn't out on the production floor. Standardized was the main focus of this. So this is where we went through and we found that this, we found that this shrink tubing was generating particles within the parts because it's getting stuck to the same fixture that they actually cut, then cut the tubing on. So those particles that are generated when cutting the shrink tubing would get stuck to the silicone and embedded in. I don't know if you can see it up there, there's a little black dot. That's one of those particles. So what we did was we went through and we found, we talked to the vendor and we got the vendors to pre-cut these things so they can be sent, already sorted, ready to be dropped into the bins so that they don't have to worry about cutting these in the process. And after that, we go through and Oh yeah, the second order was already kind of done as well by Atlas, but that whole area had been uh, five best a handful of times, and it actually makes it fairly difficult to find new things to change when it's been five best a few times a year, for a number of years. And the sustain is an ongoing process, that's something that we just kind of keep at the operators with and rely heavily on the ME that's in charge of that process. So some of the obstacles were right now at Boston Scientific, they're running six days a week mandatory, and that's both shifts, because they're building up inventory to close down the warehouse and transfer the warehouse to somewhere else. So it's been really difficult to get up there and get anything done, get engineering sample requests built, get anything like that. Um, and then actually what was difficult was determining how to do the standardized thing. How do we want to get parts in? What's the best way to make sure they're clean? We're putting them out on the clean room floor without getting them all mixed up be able to clean them in bulk. And the results of this is we have a, a, uh, a standardized solution to go in and get plugged in and everything's ready to go when the remainder of the testing is done. So my final results, there's the problem statement again. We're generating a lot of scrap, which is costing a lot of money, 1.6 million roughly. We have an estimated cost savings of 205 k I've heard that's actually gone up quite a bit recently due to bad yields. So I think they're saving even more now with this solution. Um, scrap reduction side, a standard work on the perylene that's going to help reduce some of that with the implementation of the, uh, the pre-cut shrink tubing. Um, improved, well, there we go, improved uh, quality by um, removing the, the cut-in process of the shrink tubing. 
and then the new core stock, which reduced the scrap to 2%. Just so you guys know, if it wasn't clear, um, these two are directly linked to each other. That 2% is what kind of goes through and calculates the cost savings, because that scrap reduction is where the money goes. Some of the things I learned was how important just scrap reduction, regardless of material reduction, can be within a process. Um, the importance of soft skills, that's something that's hammered home many, many times. And then the Monte Carlo analysis, how important it is to understand the variation in the process, not just looking at a snapshot within your process when you're doing an analysis of how much potential money can be saved. And then, of course, this goes actually into figuring out what I was going to do for a project and all projects is how important it is to do all your work up front and make sure you understand how your changes, what changes you're going to do, and how they're going to impact things. That? Questions? What was the original scrap rate that... It was, it fluctuates quite a bit. It's, I've actually seen numbers where it's been at like 70%, and I've seen it at 40 to 10 is, is about the <coughs> of range of it. And now you're steady at that 2% rate? That was uh, the, the production of the prototype run of that showed 2%. That was about 800 feet. They run, I want to say, about 13,000 feet a week. So it's a, it's a very small snippet. But that was part of the Monte Carlo was trying to get into the distribution and how that's going to impact the, the ultimate cost of this. Was there, Michael, was there any investment other than people's time in order to get that 200K plus? It was a lot of people's time. Um, no, that's the reason we selected it, actually, because there's no capital equipment change. It was a drop-in replacement. There was actually other solutions proposed, but they would they would have required new ovens, and that would have required possibly studying the effect that it would have on the cure rate of the silicone. Then you're talking a pretty hefty regulatory submission. It's a long that's a long game savings. If there's an extra I don't know 100k there for them to save if they want to, but that was what weighed into this, this one being selected. How tough was it to implement standard work with different operators on multiple shifts? Hasn't been implemented. It's uh, implementing a new work procedure requires uh, submissions at times. So it's a little difficult. So it's ready to all go. Questions for Micah? Good job, Micah.